After two weeks of hearings, the House Intelligence Committee is writing a report that could eventually lead to articles of impeachment. And while there are no more public hearings scheduled, Chairman Adam Schiff says investigations into the president are not over. But we're not willing uh, to uh, simply allow them to wait us out, to stall this proceeding, when the facts are already overwhelming. Uh, we're going to continue our investigation. Uh, we are going to continue to pursue Even after the documents. you've handed in the report, you're going to yes. continue? Yes. Oh, yes. The investigation isn't going to end. Meanwhile, a ruling is expected today on whether Congress can enforce subpoenas, and that case stems from a lack of cooperation by key witnesses like former White House counsel Don McGahn. Joining us now via Skype with his take on all of this is Matt Taibbi, a Rolling Stone reporter, co-host of the Useful Idiots podcast, great friend of the show. Matt, it's great to see you. Great to see you, Matt. Dude, Crystal Sager, how you doing? Of course, great. man, we're doing great. So, all right, so you've, we've got this, all these developments on Ukraine Gate. Uh, now, even after the testimony, now they say that they're thinking about trying to get Don McGahn, maybe resurrecting some of the old hits um, from the Mueller investigation. What, what, what do you make of all of this, Matt, of, of the developments of the investigation itself? Yeah, I saw um, Adam Schiff on Meet the Press yesterday, and they had like a, a graphic with like a list of all the additional leads that they were going to pursue and <laughs> oh, impeachment, God. and it was just like this and never-ending thing. And I, I think, you know, one of the things that I think has been conspicuous about impeachment from the start is that it, it was it's always been about so much more than this one narrow little uh, deal. Um, you know, a lot of the focus of the testimony has been about uh, sort of the fact that he was not taking the advice of the quote unquote uh, the uniform policy of the national security consensus. Uh, that was a term that, that came up a couple of times. And they're going to, you know, go, go through a lot of things to try to rehabilitate some of the claims of the, of the Mueller gate uh, and Russia gate uh, investigations. And so I, th I think that's something that's going to be interesting to see is what, what, where they go from here. They're going to keep fanning this thing out, I think. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, one of the challenges with sort of sorting this thing out from a journalistic perspective, from a public perspective, is that Trump will go way into the land of conspiracy theory, and then that is used to discredit some of the things that actually are on the, the reported out factual record with regards to what actually happened in Ukraine. So what I wanted to ask you is help us just sort out, like, what's conspiracy theory and what's reality with regards to Ukraine and what they did vis-a-vis -vis the 2016 election? Well, yeah, I think that's one of, been one of the difficulties of this whole thing is that um, the Democrats have asserted throughout that they use language like uh, discredited, debunked, um, you, you know, false conspiracy. These are, th you know, any, any kind of assertions, for instance, that Ukraine had any kind of involvement in the 2016 election. So you'll see a lot of conflation of two different things. Like Trump's when he asked about a favor in that call with President Zelensky, he was asking about CrowdStrike. And I think this is a reference to a theory that some people in the Republican Party have that it was Ukraine and not Russia that hacked the DNC. And I don't know of any real reporting that really supports that. But there is a story that has a lot of support. And that is the one in which some Ukrainian officials were somehow involved in helping um, the DNC contractor, Alexander Chalupa, dig up information about uh, Trump and especially Paul Manafort and what that coordination meant. There was a, there was a court case that I think it's gone back and forth that's been both asserted and, and revoked that uh, basically where the Ukrainians uh, decided as a matter of law that they meddled in the 2016 election. So you can't call it discredited and fake to say that Ukraine had some kind of involvement in our election. There is some reporting, Politico did some reporting on this, but it's it's a different story from what uh, you know Trump is asserting, and right. that's kind of the problem. Trump does something, says something crazy, but there there is some there there on the other side, and I think that's what they're also looking at. Right, yeah. and, and you know, Matt, I heard you talk about this whenever you were on Joe Rogan's podcast, in which you discussed about how difficult it is for you personally, as somebody who's covered national security state intervention in our politics for quite a long time, to watch kind of the Democratic Party and the left just say, no, all criticism of, the, of this whatsoever is no longer allowed because it appears to help and benefit the Trump narrative. And this seems particularly to be one of those cases. Yeah, and, and what I was talking about in particular, the first red flag for me was during the election in 2016 when some of us who were covering the presidential race, there were some poll results that suggested the race was a little closer 
than we thought. Additionally, a lot of us were noticing that Hillary Clinton was having a tough time filling her, her appearances, and Donald Trump wasn't. And a lot of reporters decided that it would help uh, Trump if those things were reported out or if they weren't explained away. And I, you know, my contention has been always that that doesn't help anybody because, among other things, in that case, it raised the false sense of security among Democrats that they were going to win the election. Uh, so I think it's always the press's job just to kind of tell you what we see. And then it's some, it's politicians' job, it's, it's the job of politicians to sort out what all that means. And here we have a situation where we're kind of being told we can't just tell you things that are, you know, sort of factually true because it's so politicized and people think that somehow these, these facts have political meaning that we should, we should be sorting that out at the point of reporting. And I, I don't think that's true. Yeah. I think that's really well said. I mean, it's been really, as someone who used to work at MSNBC, which, look, it's always been, you know, it's never been a perfect network, to, but to watch them basically become just a straight-up mouthpiece for the national security state has really been something to behold. And on that note, um, Malcolm Nance, who's one of their sort of most <laughs> prominent analysts, who's out with a book um, that Third he's book. blogging across, yeah. and that, you know, he goes on, I think it was Morning Joe, and talks about how the, the president was on the radar of Russia since 19. 70, whatever, and all of this is just like accepted uncritically, not right. pushed back on at all. Well, he gave an interview to Isaac Chotner over at New Yorker, and Isaac did a, a phenomenal job pushing back on him and confronted him with some of his specific assertions about Trump, about another friend of the show, Glenn Greenwald. Uh, I wonder what you made of that interview. Yeah, and I mean, I think that was that was the kind of uh, reporting that we would we'd like to see more of, right? I think Chad Chotner really challenged him up and down on all of his assertions. You know, even going back to saying the, the original story that was the first big flag for me, which was when he said that the DNC uh, emails were rife with forgeries, yes. and you know, that that story survived for quite a long time. I mean, that, you know, that was that was something that was alive in the press. I think into October of uh, 2016, and it, it just simply wasn't true. And the, the the DNC and the Democrats and the Clinton campaign could have, you know, immediately quashed that because it was circulated quite a bit. And you know, Isaac challenged them on that, and and you know, other things, you know, including calling Glenn Greenwald an asset. Well. Sort of intimating that Glenn Greenwald he was said an asset. He shows his true colors as an agent of Trump and <laughs> Moscow. That's what he said about Glenn. Yeah. Right, so it's not even intimating; it's saying, yeah. and 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 you know, and then then he'll repeat and say, "Well, editorially, I said that, or right. I was editorializing on Twitter." Well, no, that's not the way it works. And then you know, and then you 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 confront him about it, and he says, "Well, I'm an intelligence person; I'm not a journalist." Well, but you're working in the public field; right. you, you have to abide by the standards that we abide by. Like, I can't call somebody an agent or a criminal unless I can document it to the point of be, you know being a defense in a lawsuit, and and. Those standards have gone out the window in this Russia story. We're, we just call people things all the time in a way that's very damaging to them personally, and it, there's just no consequence for it. It's, it's incredible. It's so true, man, and particularly in this interview. I, I really want everybody to go read it because he goes in circles by using all of this, like, BS spy novel language. Yeah. Like, he'll be like, the black... That's a black intelligence oh, yeah. site. And I'm like, dude, you can speak plain English. And if you do, we all know that you lied whenever you said that and you're just trying to get your way out, get your way out of it. Because, and here's the best part. The morning that that went, that, that article went live yesterday or, or two days ago, he was on Amjoy with Joy Reid on MSNBC saying the exact same thing. They won't pull him off the air, Matt. And he continues to spout this stuff to millions of people. Well, yeah, and, and that tells you a lot about the values of MSNBC and the other networks that are, you know, also when, when he does this stuff, when he says, it, says things like Trump was, you know, targeted for, you know, back, back to, you know, before the first Village People album or whatever it is in 1977, <laughs> uh, you know, like other news agencies will, re will report this and it'll be a headline. And, you know, so in other, in other words, they're, they're helping spread this as well. But that just shows you where their heads are at. Like, they don't really care that it's wrong or that the, this violates, you know, pretty standard reporting ethics because it, it violates it in a direction that they like. 
uh, which is which is kind of the problem. And yeah. you know, again, you know, he's the hardest working man in show business. He's written I don't know how many books since 2016. <laughs> uh, and, and you know, this stuff it, it it has a real impact on the way people think because they're you end up. And the thing you're saying about the spy language, this is because like every, most journalists in Washington, they just all want to be like you know in a Tom Clancy novel, right? And so you say. <laughs> Sigand at them, right, and yeah. they repeat it like they know what it means, or they've been in presidential daily briefings. Like you know, dude, we see right through you. You're not a, you're not like in the CIA. You're, you're, you know, you're a journalism student at best. Cut it out, you know, and right. stuff right. It, it, that pixie dust that people like Malcolm Nance throw at them. You know, stop falling for it. It's absurd. Yeah, but so, when he's yeah. on, you know, a network that a lot of people trust, then they just assume that he must, what yeah. he's saying must be correct and they should take it seriously. Um, last question for you, Matt. We listened to you on uh, Rogan's podcast. You did a phenomenal job. What was that experience like? Oh, it's great. I mean, I, I like going, I think, I think Joe's a really interesting uh, interview. He goes all over the place and he, the reason that the shows like that are, are so popular is because it's such a dichotomy with what we see on the rest of media, where everything is predictable and ironclad, and you're only allowed to say things within a certain narrow area. So I think I think that's why people are kind of flocking to shows like Joe's, which, you know, they, they, they explore things, you discuss them, you can disagree, like all that stuff is cool. I kind of wish we could go yeah. back to doing more of that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. Well said. Matt, thank you. Great, Great to see you, see Matt. You. All right, thanks a lot, Kristen. Mm -hmm. Kristen Sager. We're going to have more Rising for you right after this.